So Terminator armor, or tactical dreadnought armor as it is also known, is some of the most badass and durable armor within the Space Marines arsenal. It is a fusion of ceramite plating and an adamantium exoskeleton. The individual who dons the suit becomes a walking tank. Now, all of the Terminator armor that the Forces of Chaos utilize can trace its origins back to the days of the Great Crusade. After Horus' rebellion ended, the traitors were pushed back into the Eye of Terror in an event known as the Scouring. After this point, they pretty much had to rely on whatever ships and armaments they had, as the Eye of Terror isn't exactly bristling with natural resources. Entire Chaos Warbands had been wiped out by other Chaos Space Marines for something as powerful as a Hellforge or as simple as clean water. And over the last 10,000 years, a lot of their stuff has been destroyed, making each suit of survival Chaos Terminator armor incredibly rare, an absolutely ancient and irreplaceable relic, as the forces of chaos have no way of replicating them. Prolonged contact with the twisting energies of the warp can have some pretty profound effects on the metal of the Terminator armor. Veins growing inside of the metal, uh, eyeballs popping up in places there shouldn't be eyeballs. The exposure to the warp for such a long period of time tends to cause Chaos Space Marines to fuse with their armor. This means that oftentimes ownership of such a suit can only pass between Marines with the death of the original owner. If they manage to slay any enemy Terminators, they theoretically could scavenge the suits and integrate them into their arsenals. This isn't the same for the Loyalists, as once the metal of the suit has been tainted by the ruinous powers, it is far too risky to ever utilize again. Now, although this may seem a little bit wasteful, it's not necessarily a problem for the forces of the Imperium, as their Forge Worlds are still able to produce new suits of Terminator armor whereas the forces of Chaos can only gather up new Terminator armor through their raids. Needless to say, an intact suit of Chaos Terminator armor is an unholy relic, and a prized possession by its owner, meticulously cared for and jealously guarded. They are most often the property of Chaos Lords in high standing, or the elite veterans sworn to protect them. And with all that clarified, let's dive into five of the coolest Chaos Terminators. But first, a quick shout out to this video's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends has taken over, and gaming will never be the same again. Raid is the first game to bring a true console level experience to your phone. With hundreds of artifacts to equip and over 600 champions, blessed with unique skills, you can build your team, develop your champions, and raid your way. And call me a filthy casual, that's totally fine. But my favorite thing about Raid has got to be the dungeon system. The campaign is cool and all, and definitely efficient for leveling up your champions. But nowadays when I play games, I don't really have a lot of time. So I like jumping in, killing a few waves of enemies, and getting right into a cool boss battle. And this month, Raid's got a non-stop schedule of special events and activities, including Forge Pass Season 3, with some amazing rewards on offer, including a limited edition artifact set. And if that's not enough, Raid's bringing out some new champions, along with some awesome looking skins for the incredible Madame Saris. But here's the big news. Later this month, Raid is giving everybody's favorite champion the upgrade he deserves. The Death Knight is finally becoming a legendary champion. And it's about time. This dude is absolutely iconic and he's been waiting for this forever. This is the best time to get started in Raid. And if you click on the link in my description or scan my QR code here on the screen, you'll get a set of unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking about the free epic champion Virgis, 200k silver, one energy refill, one XP boost, and one ancient shard. So you can summon some awesome champions as soon as you get into the game. All this treasure will be waiting for you right here. And it's that easy. Just click on the link in the description and I'll see you in game. Thanks again to the awesome people over at Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video and let's get into the grimdark. Number five, the Red Butchers. The Red Butchers are much like their namesake, a terrifying avatar of anger and wrath, a combination of ancient impenetrable Terminator plate and a crazed madman whose mind is broken in half and now wholly consumed by uncontrollable bloodlust. They're most often seen dual wielding twin power axes or dual chain fists, and when deployed, will go blind with frothing hatred and carve a bloody path across whatever battlefield they find themselves on. The origin of the Red Butchers can be traced back to the Battle of Istvan III, when the traitors sought to purge the Loyalists from their ranks. And at this point in time, the Butcher's Nails that the World Eaters are famous for was a relatively new addition to the Legion. The Nails were a barbaric device modeled after the one that was forced upon their Primarch Angle during his days on Nuceria as a gladiator, the nails amplified aggression and the production of adrenaline, and deadened all emotions that were not directly related to killing. A victim of the implants would only ever feel joy in the heat of battle, murder becoming the only form of painkiller that would lessen the agony induced by the nails. Now, many of the world leaders during Istvan III went so absolutely berserk with bloodlust that they literally had to be dragged off the battlefield in chains. However, the apothecaries of the world leaders had these individuals sedated and subdued 
rather than being put down like rabid dogs, as the Legion had a much darker plan for them. Now, it was believed that insanity could be utilized if controlled, and thus special suits of Terminator armor were created by the tech priests loyal to the Legion. And these suits would serve as a mobile jail cell. And with the press of a button, the suit's power supply would deactivate, and all of its servos would lock up. So if the Red Butchers went just a tad too crazy and couldn't be controlled, the wielder of their figurative leash could disable it safely from a distance in order to retrieve them. And I can just picture a Red Butcher going absolutely crazy and then suddenly his suit shuts down. He just topples over. He's just out there screaming at the top of his lungs on the battlefield for three days straight until his brothers find him and drag him back to the ship, still frothing and screaming the entire time. In fact, it is said that when not in use, the Red Butchers would have their suits disabled and would be hung from chains on their ship, swaying back and forth in an immobilized suit of power armor, foaming at the mouth with uncontrolled rage and resentment until such a time that the Legion would need to deploy them once again. Number 4. The Sekhmet or Scarab Occult Terminators Originally, the Sekhmet or the Scarab Occult were Thousand Suns combat veterans and individuals who had achieved some of the highest ranks within the cult system that the Thousand Suns utilized, each cult specializing in a different school of sorcery. Even the least of them held the rank of Philosophus at a minimum, which was the highest rank a cult warrior could hold before having to pass a trial known as the Dominus Limnus. Going through such an ordeal would allow the sorcerer to gain access to higher enumerations, and thus achieving the rank of Adept and unlocking the secrets of even greater magics. And through through their rigorous pursuit of knowledge, they would each become powerful psychers, wielding devastating warp manipulating abilities that could cripple the minds of their foes or break their bodies with but a thought, summoning up pillars of ethereal fire or wielding psychic force like a brutal unseen blade. The Scarab Occult were masters of the combined arts of sorcery, blade work, and marksmanship, and fought less like individuals and more as a single unit, each member reacting almost on an instinctual level to defend his brothers while smiting any that stood in their way. To an outside observer, it was like they functioned like a form of hive mind. And apart from being incredibly disciplined and trained warriors, they were also scholars and academics, as was the tradition of the Thousand Sons. The Scarab Occult, although not exclusively used for this reason, also served as the elite cabal of bodyguards that would accompany their Primarch, Magnus the Red, whenever he chose to take to the battlefield himself. Now, if I'm being honest, the way they were viewed by other legions was some on-the-nose foreshadowing by Games Workshop. You see, their supernatural levels of discipline made them seem like nothing more than robots. This was a trait that was remarked on by many of the other Primarchs, as their training had allowed them to transcend their physical and emotional weaknesses and achieve a form of emotional purity that allowed for them to follow orders at a subconscious level immediately and without question. The Khan and Lehman Russ decried them as nothing more than soulless automatons, lifeless husks that, while impressive, seemingly had no soul or the ability to think for themselves. Now, this is definitely an exaggeration, but reports by the Remembrancers who interacted with the Scarab Occult during this time did reflect a very dour and stern demeanor about them, and Ferris Manus of the Iron Hands famously called them robots at one point. However, Ozzik Ahriman believed that this was most likely a strange compliment considering the Iron Hands' affinity for machines. After the burning of Prosper, and the Thousand Sons officially being declared traitors, Ahriman would cast his rubric that attempted to purge the Thousand Sons of their genetic curse known as the Flesh Change. But unfortunately in doing so, he would damn his legion, as he caused the vast majority of his brothers who were either not psychically gifted or not strong enough to endure the psychic assault brought on by his spell to have their bodies disintegrate to ash and become fused with their armor. Now this was the case with the Scarab Occult Terminators and what are now known as Rubric Marines soulless undead killing machines that are basically just dust trapped inside a suit of armor that are now controlled by the powerful sorcerers of the Thousand Suns, whose psychic ability was strong enough to withstand the onslaught brought on by Armand's rubric. Now, there were some Terminators that survived, as the captains of these squads were most often higher rank than Philosophus, normally having passed the Dominus Limnus, putting them at least on par with a full-fledged sorcerer. Here in the 41st millennium, these Terminator captains still issue orders to the veterans in their unit, but instead of leading a noble band of brothers, they now resemble something more akin to an armored necromancer, using their potent sorcery to control a squad of undead Terminators. Number 3. The Death Shroud The Death Shroud, also known as the Pale Harvestmen or the Eyes of Mortarion, are everyone's favorite scythe-wielding nasty boys, who serve as Mortarion's unholy bodyguards and the embodiment of death itself, never speaking except to issue the orders that come straight from the Lord of Death. Their appearance alone is enough to instill a creeping feeling of dread in all that would face them in battle. Their massive hulking monstrosities, riddled with chaotic corruption and the blessings of the Grandfather, 
Their bodies are now contorted and have expanded with unnatural muscle and flabs of fat, becoming fused to their armor. Everywhere they go, they are followed by an overwhelming aura of death and despair. Each member of the Death Shroud wield an iconic power scythe known as a Man Reaper. And believe it or not, power scythes were actually used by all of the legions at one point, but quickly fell out of favor. They were big and clunky and not to mention difficult to use, and thus were eventually discontinued. However, the symbolism of the scythe makes it popular amongst the traitor legions, especially when it comes to the members of the Death Guard. And at this point in time, it's nearly synonymous with the Death Shroud. Billowing clouds of toxic fumes and disease vent from smokestacks on their armor, engulfing them in a thick, pungent miasma that causes their foes to keel over in their presence. Swarms of plague flies follow in their wake and nest in the creaks and folds of their armor, like blasphemous parasites. Now, each of the Death Shroud is a massive column of rancid fat and swollen muscles. And if their victims somehow manage to survive crossing blades with such an implacable foe, the rampant disease brought on by just being near them will inevitably bring about a far more grotesque and drawn out death. Now, unlike their crazy and grotesque appearance, the Death Shroud's role has only changed a little bit in the last 10,000 years, and their way of recruitment remains much the same. You see, when a Marine is initiated into the Death Shroud, for all intents and purposes, the man he was before is now dead, and he takes on a new life within the ranks of the Death Shroud. To his former brothers, he simply disappears, most assuming that he was killed in action. No one knows the identity of any of these Terminators, as they keep their faces hidden behind rancid, moldy cowls. But the truth is that their lost comrade now serves a much more important role, standing by the Primarch's side. The only person that knows their true identity is Mortarion himself, as he hand-selected every single one of them for either their valor and bravery during the Great Crusade, or their terrible and blasphemous raids against the forces of humanity in the 41st millennium. It is said that at all times, at least two of the Death Shroud would always be within 49 paces of their Primarch during their stint in the Crusade. Nowadays, the Death Shroud are still recruited in the same way, however, they're utilized a little bit differently. They definitely still fight by Mortarion's side when he chooses to take to the battlefield. However, now they act more as his representatives rather than exclusively as bodyguards. They enact his will across the galaxy, being assigned to different Chaos Warlords and champions of the Death Guard. The Chosen Warlords see this as kind of a double-edged sword, because on one hand, being gifted such an elite combat unit to fight by their side is an undeniable asset of incalculable value. However, as the eyes of Mortarion, they are constantly watching and judging every action the Lord takes. And needless to say, this is a lot of pressure to be under at all times. Number two, the Tyrant Siege Terminators. Now, when I think of a Terminator, I think of a big hulking brute in tons of heavy armor, bristling with overwhelming firepower that strides through a hail of bullets without even flinching. Slow and clunky heavy metal warriors that laugh in the face of the enemy resistance and crush all in their path, leaving behind nothing but fire and destruction. Now, that being said, every Terminator we've talked about so far does this in their own unique way, but none of them really embody that 80s heavy metal album cover kind of Terminator that I envision in my head. None except for the Tyrant Siege Terminators. These guys wear what was known as Cataphractic Tactical Dreadnought Armor, a suit of Terminator armor that had more armor plating than other patterns, and larger shoulder pauldrons that housed additional shield generators. These suits were some of the earliest prototypes for Terminator armor and their use ended up declining over time as the extra weight of the suit put a considerable amount of strain on the armor's exoskeleton, thus hindering its movement and the wearer's flexibility. This wasn't a problem for the Tyrant Siege Terminators, who didn't rely on speed to win battles, but more the oppressive, grinding, attrition-style tactics of an unrelenting storm of fire from an impenetrable mobile bastion. They would take this concept even further by mounting a Tyrant rocket launcher system on the shoulders, similar to that of its larger cousin, the Cyclone missile launcher. Both missile systems are similar in function, but with one major difference. The Tyrant launcher was able to fire a larger salvo of missiles, but they were unguided. So the Iron Warriors who would end up wearing these suits traded accuracy for more wanton destruction. As the spearhead and fortress breakers of the Iron Warriors, they were the Lord of Iron Perturabo's cold, calculated wrath made manifest. A savant of waging war that viewed logic and mathematics as the most powerful weapons that a warrior could wield. The Tyrant Siege Terminators could normally be found on the front lines, at the forefront of some of the most cataclysmic battles the Iron Warriors ever fought in. Although most commonly associated with the elite siege masters of the Iron Warriors, known as the Stor Bazashk, they were often sent out to other battalions when needed to aid in the Lord of Iron's many guerrilla wars. It was said that there was no fortification ever built that could stand against the cold and calculated destruction wrought by the Tyrant Siege Terminators. In the 40k tabletop game, when a single marine has a cyclone missile launcher or a hellfire rack or some kind of other equivalent system, 
it's kind of a big deal and they're seen as really special. And there are normally limitations put in place, so a Terminator unit can only have one or two of them in a squad. But back in the days of the Horus Heresy, an entire squad of Tyrant Terminators would have these things. The visual of 20 Terminators slowly marching down the field, while hundreds of missiles fly out of their shoulders. And they're simultaneously laying down a hail of bolter fire, while using their offhanded melee weapons to hack and slash at anything that gets too close, is honestly just like the coolest thing ever. And I really hope one day we end up getting rules for these guys in 40k. Or I guess I'm just gonna have to get into Horus Heresy. Number 1. The Contekar Terminators now admittedly, the Contekar Terminators are relatively new, and there's not a lot of lore on them. We really don't know too much about them, as they were only introduced to the Horus Heresy tabletop game a few years ago, and before that, the name Contekar had never appeared in any of the novels. And I know what you're thinking. If all we have to go on on these guys is a Forge World description and an article or two posted on the Warhammer community site, why am I wasting a valuable slot in this video on them? And that is an excellent question, my friend. And the answer is because it's my video and I think they're neat. But in order to get a clearer picture of them, we're gonna have to do a little bit of reading between the lines. If you were to look up Night Lord specific Terminators, most of the time what's gonna come up is the Atra Mentar. They were Terminators of the Night Lord's first company led by Jago Sevatar, a force that subsequently dissolved after the conclusion of the Horus Heresy, and now its surviving members, or at least the Terminator armor they once wore, serve as the bodyguard for powerful Night Lord's champions. From what I've been able to piece together, Atramentar refers to the Terminators within, or previously within, depending on the time period, the first company of the Night Lords. And this is gonna be a little bit of a tongue twister, but here we go. The Kentekar are a type of Terminator within the Atramentar, meaning that all of the Kentekar are Atramentar, but not all Atramentar are Kentekar, as there's lots of different types of Terminators within the Atramentar. And through the magic of editing, you're not gonna have to sit through the frankly embarrassing amount of takes that took. It is said that the Kentekar Terminators were the Night Lord's premier elite shock troops that were especially adapted to sowing panic and dismay amongst the ranks of their enemies. They had a particular talent for steadfast ruthlessness and were butchers and murderers of a higher caliber than any of their fellow Night Lord brothers, which is honestly quite a statement because the Night Lords for all intents and purposes were monsters, the vast majority of which having been recruited from Terra and Nostramo's prison populations. Although admittedly, the Terran Night Lords at least had a sense of nobility to them. The Nostramans were horrific by comparison, and were seen as poisonous to the Legion by their Terran-born predecessors and even their own Primarch, which would subsequently lead to the Night Haunter destroying the Sunless World. But that's a topic for a Night Lord's deep dive. The Kentekar would be deployed when fear was not enough. Abject despair and destruction had to be released upon the enemies of the Night Lords in order to break them. They would burn infrastructure and agriculture and completely break a civilization apart, utilizing an array of fearsome weaponry, including heavy flamers, Volkite weapons, and Nostraman chain blades. Now, despite what I said previously about Night Lord recruits, it is said that the Kentekar themselves were pulled from the noble families of Nostramo. This was the world that the Night Lords called home, a planet overrun with gangs and violence under an eternal night. And what's interesting is that Conrad Kurz took over this world and ruled through fear as anyone who broke the law would be hunted down and mutilated by the Night Haunter himself. And under his rule, the Nostraman people were terrified to so much as jaywalk or litter. But because of this, the planet seemingly turned around, crime rates plummeted, and industry skyrocketed. After the Emperor came to Nostromo, Conrad Kurz left with him to lead his legion of Terran-born soldiers, while Nostromo would continue to provide new recruits for the legion. However, after a period of about 10 years, without the Night Hunter there to rule over them, Nostromo descended back into its old ways, a dark world ruled by chaos and anarchy, where might makes right. It was at this point that the recruits sent to the Night Lords were nothing more than gutter scum, gang members and murderers, the worst of the absolute worst, psychopaths that took genuine joy in inflicting suffering, rather than the best of the best that are normally taken as recruits by Space Marine Legions. And since it states in the lore that the Kentekar are noble born, this would indicate to me that all of them came from this 10 year period, immediately after Conrad left Nostromo, which all things considered is a pretty short window of time, especially in comparison to the entire history of the Night Lords. And this may sound counterintuitive, but one of the roles that the Kentekar performed quite frequently was to wrestle control away from other Night Lord commanders that had become unfit to prosecute the Legion's objectives. Again, shortly after this 10 year period, the Legion was full of gangsters and murderers, so this type of coup was not that uncommon. If you know of any other source material that references these guys, let me know, as there's really not a lot to go on yet. 
And those were five of the coolest Chaos Terminators. Which one was your favorite? Do you prefer the sheer insane barbarity of the Red Butchers, or do you like the heavy armor and firepower of the Tyrant Siege Terminators? There's a whole bunch of other Chaos Terminators we didn't get to cover here, like the Blight Lords, the Phoenix Terminators, or even the Luna Wolves Just Darrens. If you guys like this video, I'll do a follow up with the rest of them, as well as deep dive into their loyalist counterparts as well. Consider dropping a like and clicking the subscribe button, it seriously helps my channel out. And if you actually want to see more of my videos on your feed, then click on the bell, as if you didn't no, YouTube's algorithm has changed and that's basically the new subscribe button. Thanks again to my patrons for supporting the work that I do. And if you like these videos and you want to see your name listed in the credits at the end, then consider joining my Patreon today. And that's it, that's all I wanted to say about Terminators today. I'll catch y'all in the next one.